Get it together? Okay. The records don't, we don't have diaries about this, but what we know. I mean, absolute rule. In sickness, at death, in tragedy, at birth, you get together. And there are no former Democrats and former Republicans. There's no sheep herders and cattle guys. You know, don't you shit. You, you get together. It's an absolute tradition. There's a, a farmer, Wilson, um, uh, just uh, uh, Cornish area. But anyway, a guy I, I talked to, uh, go around the farm, and I talk talk about why, why he shared work, who his grandfather did, and things like that. And he gives me the expression, a beautiful one, when you see your neighbor is in a hard place, you help them out. And we kind of smiled, and he smiled and said, well, you know, I've never, you know, I've said that, you know, because of course, it's in the blood, it's in the genes, you know, you help them out. And that, it's an agricultural tradition of great longevity. I mean, this isn't specific to Yankees or anything like that, but they did this, and they, they shared it. And it, we should uh, acknowledge that a little bit more in terms, I think, in terms of the overall uh, history of uh, connected farms or New Hampshire farms. So I'll try to rip through this and try to say, I'm going, now I'm going to try to load the factoids on, on top of you and say, why did New Hampshire farmers connect their houses and their farms together? So I'll give you a little more historical, and I'm going to come up with a big, uh, I haven't given you the big punch yet, and so we're going to give you the big, the big theory uh, about this. Here's a, here's a farmer in Aroostook County. Aroostook, you know, they grow potatoes. Actually, they were criticized for growing nothing but potatoes. They finally got a cash crop in Aroostook County, usually into the 20th century and all that, but they never made connected farms. I love this scene over here. You know, like, you know, connected farm, anybody? Anyway, they didn't make connected farms over there, but the people they did, why did they do that? Okay, let's, let's try to put all the facts together. Now remember, you got to keep this map in mind because this is pretty important. Outside of this, there's no connected farms ever, never, whatever. Okay, and when Yanks stream out of New England, they don't make connected farms here. They should have, but they, you know, did presumably did it. They didn't. I didn't show you this map, but this is even a better map because here we are in the heart. This is the heart of connected uh, uh, farm land over here. And we've dissipated percentages a little bit as we get to the periphery. But remember, this is the periphery. No connected farms outside of this area. Okay. Better what this map is about than the kind of density of the country farms, it's a map of English Yankee culture. These are Englishmen on farms. Okay? It's solid. 99.9 you know, .9 English. And not only English, in certain counties of England. Okay? And so what you have is a concentration of ethnicity, ethnicity that you don't have anywhere else in America. You know what's different about Yankee New England farmers than any other place in the country? I mean, any place in New Mexico or you know northern Montana, any place. You guys don't live next to a German farmer, a Swiss farmer. You, you're all English. Nowhere else in America is it even close to that. This doesn't explain connected farms, but it does explain why. I can give this talk here, northern New Hampshire, you know, western Mass. You know, Eastern Maine, and it's the same. Yanks are the same culturally, and they did the same thing. Doesn't explain connected farms yet, but what explains this unity? You've got massive unity. I, I go around, look at their architecture. I, I've seen hundreds and thousands of, of, of buildings in Oregon, and there's a similarity. You guys are Yanks. You guys are English guys, English people. You're doing things the same. Helps us to, to, helps us to uh, establish something about this. One of the things I've done that you haven't done is I've gone around New England and I've looked at, and this is morning in Blue Hill, Maine. Jonathan Fisher, he's a minister actually, he's doing nice painting. And I've gone to Blue Hill and I've looked at this, this um, painting over here that he did in 1824, and they're all separate house and separate barn. And all throughout New England, separate house and separate barn into the 1830s or 40s. They did not <coughs> make connected farms before 1820. Did it suddenly get cold? Well, no, that's interesting. Other things happen, here it comes. So, there's English traditions, and we're going to talk about them, but we won't hear. But one thing that did influence them a little bit was genteel, aristocratic, wealthy farmers. And that may occur to some people in this village and all that. So, here's a, a, a thing with a Jeffers House in Kennebunk. I used to live in Kennebunk, so I have some more slides for that area. But here's the Jeffers House. He's a lawyer, and he builds a state connected stable. And here's a Beverly, Massachusetts house, this other house. Have you been, uh, with a connected line of buildings to a stable? Have you been to the Runlet May House in Portsmouth? You've got some grand old houses. 
big monster house connected line with the sheds over there, stable. Okay? Mm -hmm. What are they copying? Have you been to Monticello or um, uh, uh, Mount Vernon? Mm -hmm. Connected farms. Connected farms. Okay? Now, they're connected farms because they're looking at an Italian mansions, Palladio, we say Palladian uh, uh, did mansions with extended agricultural wings, and they copy them. These are genteel folk over there, and they copy them in the, usually the larger cities, maybe some around here are done in this style, but average farmers, wealthy people in the city do a lot of crazy things when you talk about to farmers, okay, and they don't copy them, and they didn't copy them here. But something else happened, and here it comes, this part of the answer. I'm not talking New England here, we're talking other places. Okay, this is Minnesota wheat, and let's just say here, here's Kansas corn, 1890. Okay, this is more corn than, than all the farmers in Kingston will ever see in their lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> you want to compete? Huh? You, know, you guys are rock hard and all that, but there's things that you can't compete, and they couldn't compete, and what they were, they were faced with was every major agricultural crop that they had stuff that they tried to grow, animal or crop, they got beat. And the first time is even more uh, uh, tragic in, in many ways. 1820 is a good date, and something changed in 1820 that has to do with the demise of, of the prospects of New England farmers. Erie Canal opens up, okay? <clears throat> By 1830, you guys in Kingston can't sell your wheat in Portsmouth for less than they can buy the, the wheat from Ohio, Ohio farmers on the Erie Canal. Wheat. From the 10th century, before that, English people had grown wheat as a cash crop. They come to America. Wheat is, is the money, okay? And in a 10-year period, 1820, by 1830, 40, you can't grow, you, you can still grow wheat, but you can't make a big, you can't make a living off it. Okay, folks. Wool, right? Sheep craves. I don't know your period around here, but I know other, other places in, in New Hampshire. But the basic, 1820. There are, play, there are towns in New Hampshire that go, you know, they, they got a gazillion sheep, you know, like 12 farmers and all that, okay? By 1840, and certainly by 1850, you can't grow wool for profit or something, or something like that. Well, go down the list. Apples and chickens and pigs and all that. And that you're getting beat by major cash crop. Every farmer in America, and New England farmers, every time they could, you go for a single cash crop and you maximize it. It's one of the things. To, and they can't do that. But what do you do? You go to Ohio, <coughs> right? You become a lawyer. Well, but those who stayed, they had to maximize. And maximize what they could. Here's what they could. What they did was to develop a farming system. There's a little bit for these non-farmers. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. And they do this consistently. So they develop, and the words of the 19th century is mixed farming and home industry. They were advised to do this. Ags knew that they couldn't, you know, do a one cash crop because they got constantly beat out, out of lots of things. And so they maximized farm mixed farming production. A little, you know, two hogs, uh, three cattle, a little apple orchard. You know, keep on going. You know, it's 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 what you guys do. That's the mixed farming component. But more to the point here is, is the home industry component is they maximize this. This is where the back house comes in. They shoe leathers by women or hats, uh, hat laces and things like that. And these guys making shovel handle blocks. Okay, so here's the shovel handle and here's the, the, the uh, handle over there and attached to a, a, a metal uh, uh, shovel, shovel. Okay, so they're making, this is what they do. They maximized production where they could, either in wood or, or leathers or, or whatever it is, to take this economy of these farmers to make it mixed. And that's the only thing. That's what the Lord gave them possibilities. It's rocky, the soils are, the growing season short, and they made this. Now, they should have given up. <laughs> Go west, and some did. But those who stayed, retreat? Huh? Is that what you guys did at Benetton? You know? <laughs> Against the finest army in the world, Retreat, you know, against slavery, you know, the South was a juggernaut of, of, of uh, economic possibilities at the time, and you guys said abolition, and you forced the issue. Right? This doesn't seem to me like a people who back off very easily, and I don't think they did, and they didn't back off. And those farmers who who stayed retooled, and modernization 
of a certain kind was what they did. 